When I was reading the Calandry case, uh, I saw that there was a witness who lived in the neighborhood named Larry Schoen, who was a professional engineer. Uh, I looked up Larry, and Larry is an ASHRAE fellow. Um, we are doing a great deal of upper air ultraviolet light for the last 21 months to save not only um, and protect our residents and our staff, um, but millions of square feet of tenants. Uh, we are the leaders in the country at doing that. Um, been up on Capitol Hill trying to raise $500 billion so that everyone in America by a voucher system can have upper air ultraviolet light, which when used in conjunction with a small fan in a room can actually make the room 99.99% virus free in real time as we all breathe out the COVID virus 800 times an hour, 20,000 times a day, regardless of whether we're vaccinated. So um, I looked up Larry Schoen because he was an engineer. He's actually uh, went to graduate school at Princeton. He's an ASHRAE fellow, uh, quite famous, and has written a number of articles um, on upper air ultraviolet light and the effectiveness. Um, so I took a chance, uh, called his number. He's got a, his own company. Um, he still lives at Waterfowl Terrace. Um, I went to him with um, uh, three different upper air ultraviolet light fixtures and one um, uh, that's self-contained. I knocked on his door. Um, he answered. Uh, we talked about it. Um, I also said I was interested in um, the uh, Calandry house across the street. Uh, he told me at the time that he hadn't really noticed it. Um, um, and I said, well, before you were in the case, you testified, you had 20 pictures. Um, do you have those pictures? He goes, oh my gosh, that's so long ago. Uh, I'll look. Um, but um, he introduced me to um, some uh, HVAC um, uh, experts he knows. Um, so we really started uh, this process. I'm introducing him to the World Bank. I introduced him to um, Dr. Bruce Davidson, who we've used, who's one of the top five ultra, upper air ultraviolet experts in the country and um, who saved Philadelphia from a tuberculosis pandemic in 1994. He's on all the calls with the CDC, with the FDA. Um, so Larry and I got to um, uh, be very friendly on that. Uh, Larry is um, volunteering his engineering skills for a great project. Um, uh, called the Community Ecology Institute at 8000 Harriet Tubman Lane in Columbia, Maryland. It's actually very near a dear friend of ours who's um, ran all the triathlons, uh, Bob Degarito, for many, many years that Hunter did and that we did. Um, but um, so Larry was volunteering his time. This is actually a two-story barn in a, um, it's like a, a, a farm that's full of victory gardens that people all over Columbia have donated uh, all these businesses. Uh, they work with um, uh, disabled uh, young adults, um, and it's, it's really a great cause. Um, this two-story barn, uh, Larry informed me, was actually uh, built by the original owner as a hospice um, house uh, for his parents. Um, and I guess they passed away before it ever got fully utilized or they've renovated it. But um, uh, Larry asked me if, if I would um, uh, possibly donate some upper air devices um, to this community and, and I came out and saw it and, and said, of course I would. Um, it's just a, a tremendous cause. So at that time, I'd asked him if he had ever found those pictures and if he would speak to um, uh, the case. Uh, and he said he really didn't remember the case, so I read him. Uh, actually sent him and, and then read him the case, reminded him of the case, and uh, he agreed to speak. Another source of friction between Mr. Calandria and his neighbors was Mr. Calandria's other business activities allegedly carried on in Waterfowl Terrace. See December 1992 letter from Dr. Robert Beale Jr. to Bernice Kish. For the, and this is the quote, for the past several years, the Calandry family has operated several commercial ventures on our street. Those activities seem to include a junk hauling business and a rooming house.
have caused concern in my household and those of my neighbors, end quote. December 18th, 1992, letter from Dr. Robert Beal to Bernice Kish, Ibid, the junk at the time in front of my house, end quote. Lawrence Schoen, another neighbor, took 20 photographs of Mr. Calandri's vehicles and trash cans during the first months of 1993. He sent the photographs to Janet Mason, chair of the Wild Lake Village Board, with copies to Mr. Calandri and to nine community association and local government representatives. In a cover letter, Mr. Schoen describes the content of the photographs as follows. They show his several vehicles used to carry construction materials and or debris parked in various places on or around two of the three Calandry family properties in my neighborhood. One of them shows his truck blocking the sidewalk. Others show, show overflow trash and automobile parking resulting from his businesses. He has what appears to be a commercial garage filled with materials for his businesses, which faces Columbia open space. As you know, this was a period of intense attention on Mr. Calandry's activities and his failure to keep his commercial vehicles out of the area is a measure of his disdain for the laws and rules that the rest of us live by. Mr. Schoen's anxiety about Mr. Calandry's pursuit of his business ventures extended to the proposed expansion use of Bryant's Woods Inns, <coughs> one, <coughs> Bryant's Woods Inns 1 and 2 as assisted living facilities. Mr. Schoen stated that, quote, it's my understanding that Mr. Calandry has attempted to purchase still more homes in the neighborhood over the years. He seems to be interested in expanding all of the properties owned by the family. All right, Larry. So you know I'm filming this. Larry Schoen, um, I met you because you live across the street. Waterfowl Terrace, yeah. Um, and Waterfowl Terrace across the street, two houses up from the very famous Richard Calandry, you know, uh, Bryant, Woods, Bryant Woods Inn, which is now called Bryant Woods Manor. Um, and we have other interests because you're an engineer who's an ASHRAE fellow. We do upper air for all of our clients. You're very knowledgeable, written a lot of articles in that and being helpful to us. So it's moved into a different purpose, but the Bryant Woods case is famous for the neighborhood saying you can't expand from eight to 15. So it's the one case that every HOA quotes, and this is for the Gibson Island HOA. So they're worried about traffic and we have nine residents. Um, and so I said, First of all, we have parking on site for 30 cars. It's not an issue. Uh, the seniors don't drive. Um, they have a thousand member country club. It, it, it's a non-issue. But you are quoted in the case as someone who took 20 pictures, who's obviously very knowledgeable about these things. Um, and they were large construction junk vehicles. He's running another business. So at the time that he asked, which is now 28, 29 years ago, at the time that he asked to expand, um, he was violating neighborhood covenants about the trash trucks and the junk trucks and junk removal, blocking sidewalks. And he wanted to expand from eight, which wasn't a problem, um, to 15, which would have presented a problem. And he wanted to do another house in the neighborhood. So the real question with all that preamble is that correct one. And two, it's been 28, 29 years. It's run by a different gentleman who's got eight residents. Um, is it a problem? Do you notice it? Pulled down my mask. My glasses don't right. fog too much. And, uh, but, but in the years since then, I have frankly not even noticed it. Uh, it's been a non-event in the neighborhood. Uh, the problem was at the time, as you said, they wanted to expand uh, that one. And as I recall, they wanted to open another one down the block. Right. As I said, for the last 20 or more years, I haven't even noticed right. that there is anything happening there. And as you said, there were other, the, the bigger problem, a big problem, was he seemed to be running many businesses out of that same facility with construction vehicles parked right next to the open space pathway that ran next to it. And, it, and it's a, I've been to the neighborhood. It's a gorgeous neighborhood. You have a lake. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's an incredible neighborhood. Thank you. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Okay. So Richard Calandry from down in Middleburg now is still owning uh, the property of Bryant Woods Manor. Uh, he leases it 
for uh, $7,500 a month to Saji Chima uh, for Brian Woods Manor. Um, but he still has listed Brian Woods Inn as having 22 people, capability of 22 people. There are 11 bedrooms, uh, the Calandries before he started the assisted living there, the Calandries lived there for 20 years, 11 bedrooms. So he's still advertising, even though it's under lease, he's still advertising it that it's capable of holding 22 seniors, which it's not, it's licensed for eight. So he's still doing that from Middleburg as the landlord and Sajid Chima actually tried to buy the property. Larry Schoen said it was for sale for 1.5 or 1.6 a few years ago, uh, which would be appropriate if you're making $90,000 net, which is $7,500 a month, and you capped that at 10%, it'd be 900,000, and you capped it at 5%, it'd be a million eight. So capping it at 6%, it's gonna be in that million five, million six range. So again, Richard Calandry is still doing something that is not permitted under um, uh, Howard County, which is saying that he can fit 22 people there. It's not seniors, uh, disabled seniors. Uh, it's not appropriate under um, the state licensure. Uh, Sajid Chima is doing it properly. Um, he's licensed for eight. Uh, he could probably get nine or 10, uh, but currently, right now, he's licensed for eight.